You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. 15. At Serpent Coil Mountain, the gods give secret protection. At Eagle Grief Stream, the horse of the will is reined. We were telling you about Pilgrim, who ministered to the Tang monk faithfully as they advanced toward the west. They traveled for several days under the frigid sky of midwinter, a cold wind blew fiercely, and slippery icicles hung everywhere. They traversed a tortuous path of hanging gorges and cliffs, a parlous range tiered with summits and peaks. As Tripitaka was riding along on his horse, his ears caught the distant sound of a torrent. He turned to ask, Kong, where is that sound coming from? Pilgrim said, the name of this place, I recall, is Serpent Coil Mountain, and there is an eagle grief stream in it. I suppose that's where it's coming from. Before they had finished their conversation, they arrived at the bank of the stream. Tripitaka reined in his horse and looked around. He saw a bubbling cold stream piercing through the clouds. Its limpid current reddened by the sun. Its splatter in night rain stirs quiet valleys. Its colors glow at dawn to fill the air. Wave after wave seems like flying chips of jade. Their deep roar resonant as the clear wind. It flows to join one vast stretch of smoke and tide. Where gulls are lost with egrets, but no fishers bide. Master and disciple were looking at the stream, when there was a loud splash in midstream, and a dragon emerged. Churning the waters, it darted toward the bank and headed straight for the priest. Pilgrim was so startled that he threw away the luggage, hauled the master off his horse, and turned to flee with him at once. The dragon could not catch up with them, but it swallowed the white horse, harness and all, with one gulp before losing itself again in the water. Pilgrim carried his master to high ground and left the priest seated there, then he returned to fetch the horse and the luggage. The load of bags was still there, but the horse was nowhere to be seen. Placing the luggage in front of his master, he said, Master, there's not a trace of that cursed dragon, which has frightened away our horse. Disciple, said Tripitaka, how can we find the horse again? Relax. Relax, said Pilgrim. Let me go and have a look. He whistled once and leaped up into the air. Shading his fiery eyes and diamond pupils with his hand, he peered in all four directions, but there was not the slightest trace of the horse. Dropping down from the clouds, he made his report, saying, Master, our horse must have been eaten by that dragon. It's nowhere to be seen. Disciple, said Tripitaka, how big a mouth does that creature have that he can swallow a horse, harness and all? It must have been frightened away instead, probably still running loose somewhere in the valley. Please take another look. Pilgrim said, you really have no conception of my ability. This pair of eyes of mine in daylight can discern good and evil within a thousand miles, at that distance, I can even see a dragonfly when it spreads its wings. How can I possibly miss something as big as a horse? If it has been eaten, said Tripitaka, how am I to proceed? Pity me. How can I walk through those thousand hills and ten thousand waters? As he spoke, tears began to fall like rain. When Pilgrim saw him crying, he became infuriated and began to shout, Master, stop behaving like a namby-pamby. Sit here. Just sit here. Let old monkey find that creature and ask him to give us back our horse. That'll be the end of the matter. Clutching at him, Tripitaka said, Disciple, where do you have to go to find him? Wouldn't I be hurt if he should appear from somewhere after you are gone? How would it be then if both man and horse should perish? At these words, Pilgrim became even more enraged. You're a weakling. Truly a weakling. He thundered. You want a horse to ride on, and yet you won't let me go. You want to sit here and grow old, watching our bags? As he was yelling angrily like this, he heard someone calling out in midair, Great Sage Son, don't be annoyed. And stop crying, Royal Brother of Tang. We are a band of deities sent by the Bodhisattva Guanin to give secret protection to the scripture pilgrim. Hearing this, the priest hastily bowed to the ground. Which divinities are you? asked Pilgrim. 
Tell me your names, so that I can check you off the roll. We are the six gods of darkness and the six gods of light, they said, the guardians of five points, the four sentinels, and the eighteen protectors of monasteries. Every one of us waits upon you in rotation. Which one of you will begin today? asked Pilgrim. The gods of darkness and light, they said, to be followed by the sentinels and the protectors. We guardians of five points, with the exception of the golden-headed guardian, will be here somewhere night and day. That being the case, said Pilgrim, those not on duty may retire, but the first six gods of darkness, the day sentinel, and the guardians should remain to protect my master. Let old monkey go find that cursed dragon in the stream and ask him for our horse. The various deities obeyed. Only then did Tripitaka feel somewhat relieved as he sat on the cliff and told Pilgrim to be careful. Just don't worry, said Pilgrim. Dear Monkey King. He tightened the belt around his silk shirt, hitched up his tiger skin kilt, and went straight toward the gorge of the stream holding the golden hooped iron rod. Standing halfway between cloud and fog, he cried loudly on top of the water, Lawless Lizard. Return my horse. Return my horse. We now tell you about the dragon, who, having eaten the white horse of Tripitaka, was lying on the bottom of the stream, subduing his spirit and nourishing his nature. When he heard someone demanding the horse with abusive language, however, he could not restrain the fire leaping up in his heart, and he jumped up quickly. Churning the waves, he darted out of the water, saying, Who dares to insult me here with his big mouth? Pilgrim saw him and cried ferociously, don't run away. Return my horse. Wielding his rod, he aimed at the beast's head and struck, while the dragon attacked with open jaws and dancing claws. The battle between the two of them before the stream was indeed fierce. You see. The dragon extending sharp jaws. The monkey lifting his rod. The whiskers of this one hung like white jade threads. The eyes of that one shone like red gold lamps. The mouth beneath the whiskers of that one belched colored mists. The iron rod in the hands of this one moved like a fierce wind. That one was a cursed son who brought his parents grief. This one was a monster who defied the gods on high. Both had to suffer because of their plight. They now want to win, so each displays his might. Back and forth, round and round, they fought for a long time, until the dragon grew weak and could fight no longer. He turned and darted back into the water, plunging to the bottom of the stream, he refused to come out again. The monkey king heaped insult upon insult, but the dragon only pretended to be deaf. Pilgrim had little choice but to return to Tripitaka, saying, Master, that monster made his appearance as a result of my tongue lashing. He fought with me for a long time before taking fright and running. He's hiding in the water now and refuses to come out again. Do you know for certain that it was he who ate my horse? asked Tripitaka. Listen to the way you talk, said Pilgrim. If he hadn't eaten it, would he be willing to face me and answer me like that? The time you killed the tiger, said Tripitaka, you claimed that you had the ability to tame dragons and subdue tigers. Why can't you subdue this one today? As the monkey had a rather low tolerance for any kind of provocation, this single taunt of Tripitaka so aroused him that he said, not one word more. Let me go and show him who is master. With great leaps, our monkey king bounded right to the edge of the stream. Using his magic of overturning seas and rivers, he transformed the clear, limpid water of the Eagle Grief stream into the muddy currents of the Yellow River during high tide. The cursed dragon in the depth of the stream could neither sit nor lie still for a single moment. He thought to himself, just as blessing never repeats itself, so misfortune never comes singly. It has been barely a year since I escaped execution by heaven and came to bide my time here, but now I have to run into this wretched monster who is trying to do me harm. Look at him. The more he thought about the matter, the more irritated he became. Unable to bear it any longer, he gritted his teeth and leaped out of the water, crying, What kind of monster are you, and where do you come from, that you want to oppress me like this? Never mind where I come from, said Pilgrim. Just return the horse, and I'll spare your life. I've swallowed your horse into my stomach, said the dragon, 
So how am I to throw it up? What are you going to do if I can't return it to you? Pilgrim said, if you don't give back the horse, just watch for this rod. Only when your life becomes a payment for my horse will there be an end to this matter. The two of them again waged a bitter struggle below the mountain ridge. After a few rounds, however, the little dragon just could not hold out any longer, shaking his body, he changed himself into a tiny water snake and wriggled into the marshes. The monkey king came rushing up with his rod and parted the grass to look for the snake, but there was not a trace of it. He was so exasperated that the spirits of the three worms in his body exploded one, and smoke began to appear from his seven apertures. He recited a spell beginning with the letter O and summoned the local spirit, and the mountain god of that region. The two of them knelt before him, saying, The local spirit, and the mountain god have come to see you. Stick out your shanks, said Pilgrim, and I'll greet each of you with five strokes of my rod just to relieve my feelings. Great sage, they pleaded, please be more lenient, and allow your humble subjects to tell you something. What have you got to say, said Pilgrim. The great sage has been in captivity for a long time, said the two deities, and we had no knowledge of when you were released. That's why we have not been here to receive you, and we beg you to pardon us. All right, said Pilgrim, I won't hit you. But let me ask you something. Where did that monstrous dragon in the Eagle Grief Stream come from, and why did he devour my master's white horse? We have never known the great sage to have a master, the two deities said for you have always been a first-rank primordial immortal, who submits neither to heaven nor to earth. What do you mean by your master's horse? Pilgrim said, of course you didn't know about this. Because of my contemptuous behavior toward heaven, I had to suffer for this five hundred years. I was converted by the kindly persuasion of Bodhisattva Guanin, who had the true monk from the Tang court rescue me. As his disciple, I was to follow him to the western heaven to seek scriptures from Buddha. We passed through this place, and my master's white horse was lost. So, that's how it is, said the two deities. There has never been anything evil about this stream, except that it is both broad and deep, and its water is so clear that you can see right to the bottom. Large fowls such as crows or eagles are hesitant to fly over it, for when they see their own reflections in the clear water, they are prone to mistake them for other birds of their own flock and throw themselves into the stream. Hence the name, the Steep Eagle Grief Stream. Some years ago, on her way to look for a scripture pilgrim, Bodhisattva Guanin rescued a dragon and sent him here. He was told to wait for the scripture pilgrim and was forbidden to do any evil or violence. Only when he is hungry is he permitted to come up to the banks to feed on birds or antelopes. How could he be so ignorant as to offend the great sage? Pilgrim said, at first, he wanted to have a contest of strength with me and managed only a few bouts. Afterwards he would not come out even when I abused him. Only when I used the magic of overturning seas and rivers and stirred up the water did he appear again, and then he still wanted to fight. He really had no idea how heavy my rod was. When finally he couldn't hold out any longer, he changed himself into a water snake and wriggled into the grass. I rushed up there to look for him, but there was no trace of him. You may not know, great sage, said the local spirit, that there are countless holes and crevices along these banks, through which the stream is connected with its many tributaries. The dragon could have crawled into any one of these. But there's no need for the great sage to get angry trying to look for him. If you want to capture this creature, all you need do is to ask Guanxian to come here, then he'll certainly surrender. When Pilgrim heard this, he called the mountain god and the local spirit to go with him to see Tripitaka, to give an account of what had happened. If you need to send for the Bodhisattva, said Tripitaka, when will you be able to return? How can this poor monk endure the cold and hunger? He had hardly finished speaking when the golden-headed guardian called out from Midair, Great Sage, you needn't leave. Your humble subject will go fetch the Bodhisattva. Pilgrim was very pleased, shouting, thanks for taking all that trouble. Go quickly. The guardian mounted the clouds swiftly and headed straight for South Sea. Pilgrim asked the mountain god and the local spirit to protect his master and the day sentinel to find some vegetarian food, while he himself went back to patrol the stream, and we shall say no more of that.
We now tell you about the golden-headed guardian, who mounted the clouds and soon arrived at South Sea. Descending from the auspicious light, he went straight to the purple bamboo grove of the Potalaka Mountain, where he asked the various deities in golden armor and mocha to announce his arrival. The Bodhisattva said, What have you come for? The Tang monk lost his horse at the eagle grief stream of the serpent coil mountain, said the guardian, and the great sage son was placed in a terrible dilemma. He questioned the local deities, who claimed that a dragon sent by the bodhisattva to that stream had eaten it. The great sage, therefore, sent me to request the bodhisattva to go and subdue that cursed dragon, so that he might get back his horse. Hearing this, the bodhisattva said, that creature was originally the son of Arwen of the Western Ocean. Because in his carelessness he set fire to the palace and destroyed the luminous pearls hanging there, his father accused him of subversion, and he was condemned to die by the heavenly tribunal. It was I who personally sought pardon from the Jade Emperor for him, so that he might serve as a means of transportation for the Tang monk. I can't understand how he could swallow the monk's horse instead. But if that's what happened, I'll have to get over there myself. The Bodhisattva left her lotus platform and went out of the divine cave. Mounting the auspicious luminosity with the guardian, she crossed the South Sea. We have a testimonial poem that says, Buddha proclaimed the Tripitaka supreme, which the goddess declared throughout Chang'an. Those great, wondrous truths could reach heaven and earth. Those wise, true words could save the spirits damned. They caused gold cicada to cast again his shell. They moved Xuanzang to mend his ways anew. By blocking his path at Eagle Grief Stream. A dragon prince in horse form returns to the real. The Bodhisattva and the Guardian soon arrived at the Serpent Coil Mountain. They stopped the hallowed clouds in midair and saw Pilgrim Sun down below, shouting abuses at the bank of the stream. The Bodhisattva asked the Guardian to fetch him. Lowering his clouds, the Guardian went past Tripitaka and headed straight for the edge of the stream, saying to Pilgrim, the Bodhisattva has arrived. When Pilgrim heard this, he jumped quickly into the air and yelled at her, you so-called teacher of the seven Buddhas and the founder of the faith of mercy. Why did you have to use your tricks to harm me? You impudent stable man, ignorant red buttocks, said the Bodhisattva. I went to considerable effort to find a scripture Pilgrim, whom I carefully instructed to save your life. Instead of thanking me, you are finding fault with me. You saved me all right, said Pilgrim. If you truly wanted to deliver me, you should have allowed me to have a little fun with no strings attached. When you met me the other day above the ocean, you could have chastened me with a few words, telling me to serve the Tang monk with diligence, and that would have been enough. Why did you have to give him a flower cap and have him deceive me into wearing it so that I would suffer? Now the fillet has taken root on old monkey's head. And you even taught him this so-called tight fillet spell, which he recites again and again, causing endless pain in my head. You haven't harmed me, indeed. The bodhisattva laughed and said, Oh, monkey. You are neither attentive to admonition nor willing to seek the fruit of truth. If you are not restrained like this, you'll probably mock the authority of heaven again without regard for good or ill. If you create troubles as you did before, who will be able to control you? It's only through this bit of adversity that you will be willing to enter our gate of yoga. All right, said Pilgrim, I'll consider the matter my hard luck. But why did you take that condemned dragon and send him here so that he could become a spirit and swallow my master's horse? It's your fault, you know, if you allow an evildoer to perpetrate his villainies some more. I went personally to plead with the Jade Emperor, said the Bodhisattva, to have the dragon stationed here so that he could serve as a means of transportation for the scripture pilgrim. Those mortal horses from the land of the east, do you think that they could walk through ten thousand waters and a thousand hills? How could they possibly hope to reach the spirit mountain, the land of Buddha? Only a dragon horse could make that journey. But right now he's so terribly afraid of me, said pilgrim, that he refuses to come out of his hiding place. What can we do? The Bodhisattva said to the Guardian, Go to the edge of the stream and say, Come out, Third Prince Jade Dragon of the Dragon King Arwen. The Bodhisattva from South Sea is here. He'll come out then. 
The guardian went at once to the edge of the stream and called out twice. Churning the waters and leaping across the waves, the little dragon appeared and changed at once into the form of a man. He stepped on the clouds and rose up into the air, saluting the bodhisattva, he said, I thank the bodhisattva again for saving my life. I've waited here a long time, but I've heard no news of the scripture pilgrim. Pointing to pilgrim, the bodhisattva said, Isn't he the eldest disciple of the scripture pilgrim? When he saw him, the little dragon said, Bodhisattva, he's my adversary. I was hungry yesterday, and ate his horse. We fought over that, but he took advantage of his superior strength, and defeated me, in fact, he so abused me that I dared not show myself again. But he has never mentioned a word about scripture-seeking. You didn't bother to ask my name, said Pilgrim. How did you expect me to tell you anything? The little dragon said, Didn't I ask you, what kind of a monster are you and where do you come from? But all you did was shout, Never mind where I come from, just return my horse. Since when did you utter even half the word Tang? That monkey, said the Bodhisattva, is always relying on his own abilities. When has he ever given any credit to other people? When you set off this time, remember that there are others who will join you. So when they ask you, by all means mention first the matter of scripture seeking, they will submit to you without causing you further trouble. Pilgrim received this word of counsel amiably. The Bodhisattva went up to the little dragon and plucked off the shining pearls hanging around his neck. She then dipped her willow branch into the sweet dew in her vase and sprinkled it all over his body, blowing a mouthful of magic breath on him, she cried, change. The dragon at once changed into a horse with hair of exactly the same color and quality as that of the horse he had swallowed. The bodhisattva then told him, you must overcome with utmost diligence all the cursed barriers. When your merit is achieved, you will no longer be an ordinary dragon, you will acquire the true fruit of a golden body. Holding the bit in his mouth, the little dragon humbly accepted the instruction. The bodhisattva told Wukong to lead him to Tripitaka, saying, I'm returning across the ocean. Pilgrim took hold of her and refused to let go, saying, I'm not going on. I'm not going on. The road to the west is so treacherous. If I have to accompany this mortal monk, when will I ever get there? If I have to endure all these miseries, I may well lose my life. What sort of merit do you think I'll achieve? I'm not going. I'm not going. In years past, before you reached the way of humanity, said the Bodhisattva, you were most eager to seek enlightenment. Now that you have been delivered from the chastisement of heaven, how could you become slothful again? The truth of Nerva in our teaching can never be realized without faith and perseverance. If on your journey you should come across any danger that threatens your life, I give you permission to call on heaven, and heaven will respond, to call on earth, and earth will prove efficacious. In the event of extreme difficulty, I myself will come to rescue you. Come closer, and I shall endow you with one more means of power. Plucking three leaves from her willow branch, the bodhisattva placed them at the back of Pilgrim's head, crying, Change! They changed at once into three hairs with life-saving power. She said to him, When you find yourself in a helpless and hopeless situation, you may use these according to your needs, and they will deliver you from your particular affliction. After Pilgrim had heard all these kind words, he thanked the Bodhisattva of great mercy and compassion. With scented wind and colored mists swirling around her, the Bodhisattva returned to Patalaka. Lowering the direction of his cloud, Pilgrim tugged at the mane of the horse and led him to Tripitaka, saying, Master, we have a horse. Highly pleased by what he saw, Tripitaka said, Disciple, how is it that the horse has grown a little fatter and stronger than before? Where did you find him? Master, you are still dreaming, said Pilgrim. Just now the golden-headed guardian managed to bring the bodhisattva here, and she transformed the dragon of the stream into our white horse. Except for the missing harness, the color and hair are all the same, and old monkey has pulled him here. Where is the bodhisattva? asked Tripitaka, greatly surprised. Let me go and thank her. By this time, said Pilgrim, the Bodhisattva has probably arrived at South Sea, there's no need to bother about that. Picking up a few pinches of earth with his fingers and scattering them like incense, Tripitaka bowed reverently toward the south. 
He then got up and prepared to leave again with Pilgrim. Having dismissed the mountain god and the local spirit and given instructions to the guardians and the sentinels, Pilgrim asked his master to mount. Tripitaka said, How can I ride a horse without harness? Let's find a boat to cross this stream, and then we can decide what to do. This master of mine is truly impractical, said Pilgrim. In the wilds of this mountain, where will you find a boat? Since the horse has lived here for a long time, he must know the water's condition. Just ride him like a boat, and we'll cross over. Tripitaka had no choice but to follow his suggestion, and climbed onto the barebacked horse, Pilgrim took up the luggage, and they arrived at the edge of the stream. Then they saw an old fisherman punting downstream toward them in an old wooden raft. When Pilgrim caught sight of him, he waved his hands and called out, Old fisherman, come here. Come here. We come from the land of the east to seek scriptures. It's difficult for my master to cross, so please take us over. Hearing these words, the fisherman quickly punted the raft up to the bank. Asking his master to dismount, Pilgrim helped Tripitaka onto the raft before he embarked the horse and the luggage. That old fisher punted the raft away, and like an arrow in the wind, they crossed the steep Eagle Grief stream swiftly and landed on the western shore. Tripitaka told Pilgrim to untie a bag and take out a few tang pennies to give to the old fisherman. With a shove of his pole, the old fisherman pulled away, saying, I don't want any money. He drifted downstream and soon disappeared from sight. Feeling very much obliged, Tripitaka kept folding his hands to express his gratitude. Master, said Pilgrim, you needn't be so solicitous. Don't you recognize him? He is the water god of this stream. Since he didn't come to pay his respects to old monkey, he was about to get a beating. It's enough that he is now spared from that. Would he dare take any money? The master only half believed him when he climbed onto the barebacked horse once again, following Pilgrim, he went up to the main road and set off again toward the west. It would be like this that they, through the vast thusness too, reached the other shore and climb with hearts unfeigned the spirit mount. Master and disciple journeyed on, and soon the fiery sun sank westward as the sky gradually darkened. You see, clouds hazy and aimless, a mountain moon dim and gloomy. The sky, all frosty, builds the cold. Howling wind around cuts through you. One bird is lost midst the pale, wide sandbars. As twilight glows where the distant hills are low. A thousand trees roar in sparse woods. One eight cries on a barren peak. No traveler is seen on this long road. When boats from afar return for the night. As Tripitaka, riding his horse, peered into the distance, he suddenly saw something like a hamlet beside the road. Liu Kong, he said, there's a house ahead of us. Let's ask for lodging there and travel again tomorrow. Raising his head to take a look, Pilgrim said, Master, it's no ordinary house. Why not, said Tripitaka. If it were an ordinary house, said Pilgrim, there would be no flying fishes or reclining beasts decorating the ridge of its roof. That must be a temple or an abbey. While they were speaking, master and disciple arrived at the gate of the building. Dismounting, Tripitaka saw on top of the gate three large characters, Lisha Shrine. They walked inside, where they were met by an old man with some beads hanging around his neck. He came forward with hands folded, saying, Master, please take a seat. Tripitaka hastily returned his salutation, and then went to the main hall to bow to the holy images. The old man called a youth to serve tea, after which Tripitaka asked him, Why is this shrine named Lisha? The old man said, This region belongs to the Hamel kingdom of the western barbarians. There is a village behind the shrine, which was built from the piety of all its families. The Li refers to the land owned by the whole village, and the Shi is the god of the soil. During the days of spring sowing, summer plowing, autumn harvesting, and winter storing, each of the families would bring the three beasts, three flowers, and fruits to sacrifice at the shrine, so that they might be blessed with good luck in all four seasons, a rich harvest of the five grains, and prosperity in raising the six domestic creatures. 
for when Tripitaka heard these words, he nodded his head to show his approval, saying, This is truly like the proverb, even three miles from home there are customs entirely distinct. The families in our region do not practice such good works. Then the old man asked, Where is the honorable home of the master? Your poor monk, said Tripitaka, happens to have been sent by the royal decree from the great Tang nation in the east to go to seek scriptures from Buddha in the western heaven. It was getting rather late when I passed your esteemed edifice. I therefore came to your holy shrine to ask for a night's lodging. I'll leave as soon as it gets light. The old man was delighted and kept saying, Welcome. Welcome. He called the youth again to prepare a meal, which Tripitaka ate with gratitude. As usual, Pilgrim was extremely observant. Noticing a rope for hanging laundry tied under the eaves, he walked over to it and pulled at it until it snapped in two. He then used the piece of rope to tie up the horse. Where did you steal this horse? asked the old man, laughing. Old man, said Pilgrim angrily, watch what you are saying. We are holy monks going to worship Buddha. How could we steal horses? If you didn't steal it, laughed the old man, why is there no saddle or rein, so that you have to rip up my clothesline? This rascal is always so impulsive, said Tripitaka apologetically. If you wanted to tie up the horse, why didn't you ask the old gentleman properly for a rope? Why did you have to rip up his clothesline? Sir, please don't be angry. Our horse, to tell you the truth, is not a stolen one. When we approached the Eagle Grief stream yesterday from the east, I had a white horse complete with harness. Little did we anticipate that there was a condemned dragon in the stream who had become a spirit, and who swallowed my horse in one gulp, harness and all. Fortunately, my disciple has some talents, and he was able to bring the Bodhisattva Guanin to the stream to subdue the dragon. She told him to assume the form of my original white horse, so that he could carry me to worship Buddha in the western heaven. It has barely been one day since we crossed the stream and arrived at your holy shrine. We haven't had time to look for a harness. Master, you needn't worry, said the old man. An old man like me loves to tease, but I had no idea your esteemed disciple was so serious about everything. When I was young, I had a little money, and I, too, loved to ride. But over the years I had my share of misfortunes, deaths in the family and fires in the household have not left me much. Thus I am reduced to being a caretaker here in the shrine, looking after the fires and incense, and dependent on the goodwill of the patrons in the village back there for a living. I still have in my possession a harness that I have always cherished, and that even in this poverty I couldn't bear to sell. But since hearing your story, how even the Bodhisattva delivered the divine dragon, and made him change into a horse to carry you, I feel that I must not withhold from giving either. I shall bring the harness tomorrow and present it to the master, who, I hope, will be pleased to accept it. When Tripitaka heard this, he thanked him repeatedly. Before long, the youth brought in the evening meal, after which lamps were lit and the beds prepared. Everyone then retired. Next morning, Pilgrim arose and said, Master, that old caretaker promised last night to give us the harness. Ask him for it. Don't spare him. He had hardly finished speaking when the old man came in with a saddle, together with pads, reins, and the like. Not a single item needed for riding a horse was lacking. He set them down in the corridor, saying, Master, I am presenting you with this harness. When Tripitaka saw it, he accepted it with delight, and asked Pilgrim to try the saddle on the horse. Going forward, Pilgrim took up the accoutrements and examined them piece by piece. They were indeed some magnificent articles, for which we have a testimonial poem. The poem says, the carved saddle shines with studs of silver stars. The precious seat glows with bright threads of gold. The pads are stacks of fine-spun woolen quilts. The reins are three bands of purple cords of silk. The bridle's leather straps are shaped like flowers. The flaps have gold-etched forms of dancing beasts. The rings and bit are made of finest steel. Waterproof tassels dangle on both sides. Secretly pleased, Pilgrim put the saddle on the back of the horse, and it seemed to have been made to measure. 
Tripitaka bowed to thank the old man, who hastily raised him up, saying, It's nothing. What do you need to thank me for? The old man did not ask them to stay any longer, instead, he urged Tripitaka to mount. The priest came out of the gate and climbed into the saddle, while Pilgrim followed, hauling the luggage. The old man then took a whip out from his sleeve, with a handle of rattan wrapped in strips of leather, and the strap knitted with cords made of tiger ligaments. He stood by the side of the road and presented it with hands uplifted, saying, Holy monk, I have a whip here that I may as well give you. Tripitaka accepted it on his horse, saying, Thanks for your donation. Thanks for your donation. Even as he was saying this, the old man vanished. The priest turned around to look at the Lisha shrine, but it had become just a piece of level ground. From the sky came a voice saying, Holy monk, I'm sorry not to have given you a better reception. I am the local spirit of Padalaka Mountain, who was sent by the Bodhisattva to present you with the harness. You too must journey to the west with all diligence. Do not be slothful in any moment. Tripitaka was so startled that he fell off his horse and bowed toward the sky, saying, Your disciple is of fleshly eyes and mortal stock, and he does not recognize the holy visage of the deity. Please forgive me. I beseech you to convey my gratitude to the Bodhisattva. Look at him. All he could do was to count out toward the sky without bothering to count how many times. By the side of the road the great sage son reeled with laughter, the handsome monkey king broke up with hilarity. He came up and tugged at his master, saying, Master, get up. He is long gone. He can't hear you, nor can he see your kowtowing. Why keep up this adoration? Disciple, said the priest, when I kowtowed like that, all you could do was to stand snickering by the side of the road, with not even a bow. Why? You wouldn't know, would you, said Pilgrim. For playing a game of hide-and-seek like that with us, he really deserves a beating. But for the sake of the Bodhisattva, I'll spare him, and that's something already. You think he dares accept a bow from Old Monkey? Old Monkey has been a hero since his youth, and he doesn't know how to bow to people. Even when I saw the Jade Emperor and Lousy, I just gave them my greeting, that's all. Blasphemy, said Tripitaka. Stop this idle talk. Let's get going without further delay. So the priest got up and prepared to set off again toward the west. After leaving that place, they had a peaceful journey for two months, for all they met were barbarians, Muslims, tigers, wolves, and leopards. Time went by swiftly, and it was again early spring. You could see jade green gilding the mountain forest, and green sprouts of grass appearing. The plum blossoms were all fallen, and the willow leaves gently budding. As master and disciple were admiring this scenery of spring, they saw the sun sinking westward again. Reining the horse, Tripitaka peered into the distance, and saw at the fold of the hill the shadow of buildings, and the dark silhouette of towers. Wukong, said Tripitaka, look at the buildings over there. What sort of a place is that? Stretching his neck to look, Pilgrim said, it has to be either a temple or a monastery. Let's move along and ask for lodging over there. Tripitaka was glad to follow this suggestion, and urged his dragon horse forward. We do not know what took place thereafter, let's listen to the explanation in the next chapter. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you.